All right, welcome to another episode of Around the County. I'm Miles Himmel, Communications Director with San Diego County Supervisor Jim Desmond, who is also here with us. And we've got a special guest today. Uh, he's been in the news a lot, and so we're going to jump into some of the different things. Dr. Martin Kohldorf. Um, Dr. Uh, you're at Harvard uh, University, I believe, correct? Is that, is that correct? Correct, yeah. Uh, can you kind of bring us back to when you first heard about COVID-19, what your thoughts were, and then over the last few months, what you've seen? So, like everybody else, I heard of it uh, in Wuhan, and uh, I started to look at the numbers because that's what epidemiologists do. And I quickly uh, made two conclusions. One is that this was going to be a worldwide pandemic. We weren't going to be able to stop it spreading around the world. And two, I looked at the numbers by age, and I concluded that my, my children were saved. And so I was worried for about 10 minutes, but when I realized that the children, my kids are safe, that's what matters most to me. So uh, that made a huge relief to me. And already from the numbers in Wuhan, it was clear that uh, while everybody can be infected, the risk, the difference in risk is more than a thousand fold between the oldest and the youngest. Uh, so we know now that among the older people, COVID is, of course, worse than the flu, typical flu season or even a bad flu season. But uh, for children, this is much less dangerous than the annual flu because in the U.S. every year, about between 200 and 1,000 people, uh, children will die in flu every year. And uh, depending on if it's the bad flu season or less bad flu season. So for children, this is less dangerous than the flu. Doctor, I should have asked you this in the beginning here because that's all fascinating. If you don't mind for the folks who are listening or watching this, can you give them uh, uh, your background in the science field? Uh, okay, so I'm a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. And uh, uh, some of the research I do is uh, for a couple of decades, I've been working on infectious disease outbreak how to detect them, and how to monitor them. So in infectious diseases, there's sort of three areas because nobody knows everything about infectious diseases. So one is the virology and immunology. How does the body uh, defend itself against viruses and how does virus operate and so on? So that's sort of the basic science of uh, what you need. And you need to know that in order to develop vaccines. The second one is how to treat infectious diseases, uh, how to... Uh, uh, so physicians who work in hospitals, how do we treat it? And those two areas, I mean, I know a little bit about it, but I'm not an expert in neither of those areas. The third area, so for example, immunology, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci is an expert in immunology. Uh, uh, so we each have our areas of expertise. So, so my area is the population aspects of infectious diseases, how it spreads in society, uh, how you detect it, how you monitor it, how you control it, uh, how you minimize the number of people, uh, uh, the, the, the mortality rates and so on. Uh, so that's part of public health and epidemiology. So that's my area of expertise. I also do uh, uh, epidemiology on uh, vaccine safety to monitor vaccine, the safety of vaccines after they are approved. I work with CDC uh, on uh, those issues. So with the vaccine, because in, in order to get to uh, the best stage that we can in, in San Diego County, with, uh, or even in California, to even be 50% open, we have this threshold of only one positive per 100,000 people, and, and, uh, which is a very, very high threshold to get to, to even be 50% open in, in, Cal in California. It, but, I mean, we, I've heard people you know, saying, even if we had a vaccine tomorrow, you know, 50% or a, a large percentage of people wouldn't even take it. And, and I guess for it to be safe, you were just talking about that. How long does it take to know a vaccine is safe or once, once it hits the market or, or, or whatever, how it's, how it's rolled out? Uh, so as soon as we have a vaccine market, we will monitor the safety on a weekly basis. So we're using electronic health data to uh, see everybody who got the vaccine and then um, what kind of adverse reactions do they have? Because somebody might have, uh, 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 let's say, a stroke two weeks after they got the vaccine, but it might have nothing to do with the vaccine. So we have to see if there are more uh, than you would expect by chance. And uh, 
but even before approval, we know uh, uh, some things about the safety because that's part of the clinical trials to evaluate vaccines. But in terms of the threshold, there's two problems with that. One is if you have a certain number of cases per 100,000 or whatever, it depends on how much you test. If you test more, you can have more cases. If you test less, you have less cases. So that metric is, doesn't really depend on how much disease there is in, in society, in the community. It depends more on how much testing you're doing. Because there's so many asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic people. So it's not a very smart measure to use for uh, uh, policy decision making. Uh, the other problem is that with this is that if uh, children or students or young adults, if they are infected, they have so low risk. But that's not really, that's not gonna lead to mortality. Uh, so uh, instead it will lead to more immunity in the community, which eventually will protect everybody. On the other hand, if you have older people getting infected, uh, that's a huge problem because they are very, uh, they have high risk for mortality. So uh, it depends also on who gets infected, whether we have a big problem or not. Well, part of, I guess, you, uh, Miles, you want to ask about the Barrington uh, yeah, project well, here or the research? That yeah, you know, Doctor, I, we've uh, interviewed Dr. Bhattacharya, and, and I saw this thing come out the other day, and we got a bunch of emails, and people said, you know, because we've been sitting here trying to get people back to work, get kids back in school, do it safely, obviously, but we, we, we came across what you guys did, the Great Barrington Declaration. If you don't mind, describe it, how it came to fruition, and, and why you guys are doing it. Uh, so it was authored and signed by myself, uh, uh, Dr. Jay Patashaya at Stanford, who you know, and also the world's preeminent infectious disease technologist, uh, Dr. Sunita Gupta at Oxford University uh, in England. And the idea is that if you have an enemy, and I think COVID-19 is our enemy here, you have to look at what is the weaknesses of the enemy if you're going to defeat, uh, defeat it. And the weakness is that of COVID is that while it's dangerous for the old, it's not dangerous for the young. So if we do nothing, if we have a completely less fair approach to, uh, to COVID, which we should not have, what will happen is that we get quite a few year old people uh, who get infected and many of them will die or a big proportion. And we get young people infected, but they're gonna do fine because very low risk. So that's not a good strategy because a lot of old we have a lot, lot of mortality then because a lot of old people will be affected. If we do uh, a general lockdown across all age groups, that means that we we're going to push the pandemic forward in time. We're going we're gonna to postpone it and drag it out for a longer time. But we will still have, since this, everybody is protected equally, we'll still have uh, a bunch of old people and a bunch of young people getting infected. And among the old people, there will be many, uh, some of them will die and therefore will have high mortality. So both of these strategies are bad strategies if you want to minimize mortality in the long run. One will be just sort of push it in the, uh, one will happen sooner and the other one will just push it forward in time. Now, what we propose in the Great Barrington Declaration is to do a, a focus protection. And this is nothing new because this is standard public health practice from before COVID. And that is, we need to do uh, uh, do better when it comes to protecting the elderly. So for example, in nursing homes, we have to do more testing, both of the staff and the visitors, frequent testing, to be sure we don't uh, infect the old people. Uh, teachers above age 60 should work for home, uh, either teaching online or uh, uh, help other teachers with grading exams or homeworks or essays. Uh, so there are various things that we can do to protect the elderly at the same time as uh, children and young adults should be able to live uh, normal lives because they are not at risk. And of course, we can't protect the elderly 100%, but the longer we drag it out, the more difficult it actually is to protect the elderly. Hmm. So and the reason for doing the, for, for the young, we have a lot of collateral damage now. Children, for example, they need to go to school, not just for the education, but also for physical health and the mental health. So we have big problems now, and just learning how to socialize with friends. So this is very, very important for children 
and there are similar things for young adults. So the collateral damage, we're really putting the burden with the lockdowns, we're putting the burden on the children. Um, uh, but there's not even a benefit on it for, because for the older, this, the, the more we drag it out, the worse for them, the harder it is for them to protect themselves. Well, but, and we're dragging it out how? We're dragging it out by not opening up as a society? Or is that, or what, in what means are we dragging it out by the fact that, I guess, we're closing down? Yeah, because uh, if you do a lockdown, you're not going to prevent, this is, this, uh, COVID-19 is not going to go away. It will be with us for forever. It's going to eventually become endemic. But when there are so many who are susceptible, who can get infected, what happens is that we're going to have a big bump, which we had uh, in the spring and, uh, and later on in other places. But uh, at some point, enough people have become infected, and then it's going to die down, and it will be endemic. So there will be a few cases. So that's going to happen for, 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 for decades. But uh, once we're through that hump, then it will be like a normal uh, disease, like a normal coronavirus or, or some other type of pathogen. Well, when we started out, I guess, with the with pandemic, we had, you know, we are, we're all concerned about hospitals and ventilators and protective yeah. equipment and everything else. But now it's number of cases. And here in San Diego County, about in, in, over Labor Day weekend, uh, one of our universities, our, our, one of our popular universities, um, you know, had like a thousand positive cases, people testing positive or students testing positive primarily because they were coming back to this dorms, they were coming back to their, you know, the houses that they had already rented and things like that. And so we, but we only had one go to the hospital. And I right. guess the pushback was, uh, okay, with these kids though, they maybe they go home to their grandparents or there, or, their, or, you know, they interact with their family members and they affect elderly. So that's why we, you know, we, we you know, potentially have to draw it or, or not open again or, or, or slow down our process. So when we have those large spikes, but not the hospitalizations, everybody seems to be focused on the number of cases. And to me, that's the herd getting it, as opposed to, you know, our, our whole system's gonna fall apart. I, I, could you, I don't know, address I, that or talk to the cases? I agree with that. Uh, it doesn't make sense to look at cases, uh, because it, uh, so what we have to look at, there are three metrics. One is the hospitalizations. Mm -hmm. And it was correct in the spring, we had to flatten the curve so that we didn't overburden the hospitals. I don't think that is the risk right now. But uh, uh, so hospitalization is important. And then it's the mortality. And then the third one is actually uh, excess mortality when we compare the mortality with prior years. Uh, those are the three metrics that are relevant. Uh, there are so many in COVID-19, there are so many people who are infected, but they are asymptomatic or, or very mildly symptomatic. So uh, physicians, would, many physicians, we are say that that doesn't even make sense to talk about cases because they have no symptoms. So doing this <laughs> testing in universities and schools uh, is not uh, proper public health practice. Well, in, in many of the, um, I guess the reasons for, for shutting down is, is the number of cases. And it just doesn't, it doesn't seem, like you, like you said, it's not the right metric, uh, you know, for, for for testing is we should be so should we be testing everyone or or you know focusing yeah. on the seniors and who, who should we be testing? Should, we, we should increase testing for uh, for the elderly uh, nursing homes for example but also other uh, health care like if you are senior senior centers the staff should be tested okay uh, so uh, that is very important to increase that kind of testing to protect them but to test the children or the college students uh, doesn't make sense. If a child is sick, let them stay home. Doesn't need to do testing for that. If they are asymptomatic, let them go to school. We don't need to know if they have some uh, viruses in their body or not. Well, one of the things that was, that was brought up was that, um, okay, there's gonna be more suicides uh, beca because of people being shut in and not being able to go to work and they're you know, frustrated or, or anxiety over, over not you know, having a paycheck and, and being able to pay rent and things like that. We didn't really, in San Diego County, we didn't see a large increase in suicides, but we've seen a huge increase, almost fourfold in drug overdoses or death by drug overdoses, for particularly fentanyl and, and other types of, of I guess, coping drugs 
we've had a huge, I mean, what other, I mean, uh, effects, I guess, as you mentioned, the, there's other side effects to this virus by, by shutting down businesses that were actually, you know, the, the, the cure is worse than the, 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 than the illness itself. I, I do you have any comments on that. No, I agree with that. And I mean, mental health is a huge part of it. Uh, however, it sort of manifests, even if it's not an overdose or, or suicide, there are still a mental health problems because most people don't go to those extremes. So those are just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, <coughs> sorry, that's, that's a huge issue. Uh, but what we're doing now, we're basically protecting lower risk college students and lower risk professionals, uh, young professionals who can work from home, like bankers, uh, scientists like me, journalists, uh, Etc. While the uh, it's the working class that's sort of taking on the burden of generating herd immunity in the community. So bus drivers, uh, janitors, uh, supermarket uh, clerks, and so on. So uh, uh, this is sort of a double whammy against the working class because both they are, they are taking the burden for generating the immunity uh, and having the highest mortality, and we have seen that. Uh, from several places in North America. Uh, at the same time, they also take the highest burden for, for, the, uh, for the collateral damage, both in terms of public health, but also like house evictions, uh, et cetera. So uh, this is really, I think, uh, uh, the biggest assault on the working class in, uh, in many decades. Well, do you, do you have like, I don't know, Miles, if, if you had other questions, but what's your message to the American people? Is it get back to normal or you do it safely? Or, or have you got, I mean, if, you know, if you were giving a talk on this, what would you, what would you say to people? How's the best way to cope and deal with this? Uh, two things. For uh, older people should be very careful. They should be as careful as they can. Uh, uh, and uh, we, the, as a whole society, should help them protect themselves as much as possible. For example, helping them with not having to go to the supermarket, delivering the groceries to their door, et cetera. So that's the one. We have to do a better job at that. We're doing better now than we did in the spring, but we have to do even better uh, on that side. And then the other side is for, uh, for children should go to school. Uh, they should, uh, in person, and the university should be open for in-person teaching. They should live, uh, wash their hands and those kind of things and stay home if you're sick, but otherwise live normal lives. And the same thing for young adults. And then we have like a group in the 50s who are sort of in between. Yeah, it, like, like me. <laughs> yeah, myself also. But, uh, well, Miles, did you have anything else you wanted to I've add? I've had a couple questions, and this one is always, I mean, it, we, I've asked this to pretty much everyone we've had on. Uh, you, you talked about this is not how, I forget the exact sentence you said earlier, but you said this is not how we've ever done anything like this. Like we've never, and we've talked to other doctors, and they said, you know, we've always, when we've had, the, whether it's the swine flu or whether it's the, a bad flu year, we've never shut things down. Doctor, why, why now? Why, why, why this hysteria? Or why, why the shutdowns like this? Uh, I don't know. I'm a, as, a, as a public health scientist, I'm absolutely stunned. And uh, I don't know. I think uh, it's better to ask that question to a psychologist or sociologist or journalists or, uh, or I don't know who, but I am absolutely stunned. And if you go and look, uh, most countries, at least most Western countries, would have sort of a pandemic preparedness plan because we knew there was going to come a pandemic sooner or later. We just didn't know when or what type. But we knew we were going to come, and they will come more after this. So uh, uh, all those uh, pandemic preparedness plans were basically thrown out the window, and instead we do this uh, lockdown experiment. Uh, which so no, I'm sorry, well, I can't well, answer your question. I don't yeah, know why. No. <laughs> I, well, I don't think there is an answer. <laughs> yeah. Well, can I follow up on that? Because you know, it, Italy was in the news quite a bit because they had a huge breakout. The UK is still kind of struggling. I'm just, any opinions on those countries that are, you know, like the UK that is still struggling quite a bit, um, as opposed to some countries who've kind of gone through it? Yeah, so some countries have sort of gone through it more. Uh, I'm sure Northern Italy, for example, and uh, I'm sure part of Sweden. 
uh, maybe parts of New York or parts in the United States, maybe Florida and so on. So some have sort of gone through more of it. They, uh, it's never going to go away completely, but there is enough immunity in the community that there's not going to be a huge uh, probably peak later on. But it might be another peak, we don't know, because there might also be a seasonal component. But then those who could have shut down before they had many cases, uh, they still haven't had many. So they still have a susceptible population with very little immunity. So uh, sooner or later, they're going to get it. So there will be uh, further uh, increases because of that. I think that's unavoidable. And it's sort of a little bit tricky to talk about Italy or UK or the US because it varies so much geographically. So northern Italy has hit hard, but uh, it, there might still be not southern Italy less. Uh, in the US, for example, New York and New Jersey, uh, Massachusetts has been hit very hard, but certain parts of the Midwest have not seen many. And Alaska or Maine have had the very little. All right. Well, doctor, um, I know we'll let you go here because I know you've been very busy, but um, I, I think you're encouraging the public too to, to go to the Great Barrington Declaration uh, website, which is gbdeclaration.org. Is that correct? What could, what, how can people correct. help? So, uh, yeah, go there and read the declaration. It was very short, but there are also some videos to, uh, where we sort of explain things in more detail. And people can sign the declaration if they agree with it. So, Fantastic. We can, I think, have. Uh, uh, 100 and over 170 people have signed it, 170,000 people have signed it, including thousands of uh, medical and public health scientists and medical practitioners. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, Jim, you want to take it, take it away? Well, I just want to say thank you very much for coming on, and Doctor, and being part of this and, and giving us your insights and, and uh, you know, knowledge, you know, did kind of a common sense approach to, the, to this thing. And, and uh, we've got to let it play out. And like you said, the longer we delay it, the worse it's going to be, particularly for the for our elderly population. So, uh, yeah, appreciate your time, and thank you for a nice, uh, frank discussion and all your insights as well. I appreciate all right. that.